Good morning. You can be opening your Bibles to Genesis 37. Genesis 37 is where we're going to begin. If somebody were to ask you why hope is important to have in your life, what would you say to that question? We live in a society that I think has less and less hope, and there's lots of ways that you could see why that would be the case. But to be described as somebody who is hopeless is a sad state. Um, what, what difference does it make in your life to have a real, authentic hope? And I, I wanna, we're going to look at Genesis 37, but I want to put a couple of verses on the PowerPoint uh, just to frame what we're looking at. But Paul, in writing to a group of people that were suffering says this in 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 3, that Paul was remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see here that he ties the idea of hope with steadfastness? That in other words, if you don't have hope, you don't have steadfastness. The place that steadfastness comes from is by being somebody who has hope. Sometimes people will put their hopes in a nation or they'll put their hopes in some kind of earthly circumstance. And sometimes people will think, well, I think God promised that that the nation's going to become this way. Or I think that God promised me that this thing is going to work out in my life and I'll get this job or that job and everything's going to be okay." That's not what we mean by where we put our hope. Your hope is only as strong as where you place it. And in this passage, your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. If it's, if it's in anything else, it's a hope that's going to crush you and ultimately won't give you steadfastness. Steadfastness, by the way, is the ability to bear up under difficulties without giving in or giving up. Look at another passage, though. In Hebrews 6, 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the, the curtain. Here the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to an audience that's being persecuted and mistreated, and he says that your hope is not in things getting better in this life. Maybe sometimes that'll happen, but you can't be guaranteed that God has promised you that. And so here he says that your hope is something that goes to the inner place behind the curtain, talking about the heavenly places. Have you ever been on a boat before? And you weren't, you weren't looking around, like maybe you were fixated on a map or something. And you look up after a couple minutes and you realize that you've drifted way farther than you realized. What this passage is saying is that hope functions like an anchor. It keeps you in a certain place that you want to be so that you're not drifting to other places. Hope, another way that we could title this sermon is the power of hope. Do you know what hope does when you really have it? When you have hope in the things that God has ultimately promised. If that's your expectation and that's your future desire, more than anything else, you're somebody who has an anchor. And you're somebody who has steadfastness. Now, where do we get this from? Where do we cultivate hope? There's a lot of different proper answers to that question, but let me show you one other passage right now. Paul says in Romans 15, verse 4, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Paul says here that if we go back to the things that are written in the former times, which from his perspective would have been the Old Testament Scriptures, that you can go back and read some of these passages and get encouragement and find hope. I think oftentimes we'll think, okay, if I look at the New Testament and I think about Jesus and what he's promised and the red letters in the Bible and all the things that he said, that that's what I can get hope from. And absolutely that's right. But the Bible also says that if you go back to the things that happened before and you see how God worked in the lives of people, that it can cultivate hope. So what I want to do in this lesson is I want to look at three vignettes. Three people in the Old Testament that were promised something 
And then they had to endure a lot of things before they ever had the fulfillment of their promise. But then see that God gave them the things that they promised, even though it didn't always seem like it was going to happen. We're going to look at the example of Joseph, Moses, and David. All three of them were given promises, and then they had to wait a certain amount of time, and they had to endure difficulties. But their hope functioned as an anchor. Their hope caused them to have steadfastness to eventually get the things that were promised. And so in all of these examples, we're looking at wide amounts of texts, large stories, but we're going to just zero in on a couple things for each of these stories. So let's start with the story of Joseph and look at the promise that Joseph received in Genesis 37, uh, starting around verse 5. Look at Genesis 37, starting in verse 5. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. I'm sure they are very eager to hear this one. Behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And look at verse 10 also. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? Uh, it, Joseph here has these two dreams, and some people have criticized his zeal uh, in continuing to share these things with his brothers and his parents, and it seemed to bother them quite a bit. The first dream was that these sheaves, they were binding all these sheaves, and, and each person is represented by a sheaf, and Joseph arose and all the other sheaves bowed down to him, and his brothers immediately understand, are you suggesting that we're all going to bow down to you one day, Joseph? Uh, we don't really like what you're saying about that. And then I guess he has another dream and says, well, it's not just you guys, but it's, it's the sun and the moon. Mom and dad are also going to bow down to me, and uh, I don't know how all this is going to happen, but it, he's being promised through these dreams that there's going to be something that's going to happen in the future where this exaltation is going to happen. And the psychology behind why Joseph is sharing all of that, I don't know. The bottom line for right now is that God was giving him these promises. Now, when were they fulfilled? They were fulfilled after Joseph is able to store up the grain like from the other dreams that he was interpreting later, and his family comes seeking food for, from him in Egypt, and they all bowed down before him and recognized that his wisdom was correct. Now, how much time had to pass from the time Joseph received these promises and from the time that they were fulfilled? Well, Genesis 41, verse 46 says Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. At the beginning of this story, Joseph is 17 years old, back in Genesis 37, verse 2. So there you have at least 13 years before he starts to get this exaltation. But even after that, there's the seven years of plenty where they store up grain, and then it's the seven years of famine where his brothers finally come to him. Joseph is waiting at least 20 years for him to be able to have the fulfillment of these promises. Do you suppose that when he got these dreams, though, that he kept thinking about these things? And that he, as he kept thinking about these promises of God, that it served as an anchor, and it served as a steadfast thing for him to be able to deal with all the difficulties. Well, what, what were some of the things that he endured that his hope helped lift him out through? There's a lot of things that we could say, but let me say this one. Uh, false accusations. Remember when he was with uh, working at Potiphar's house and Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him of making sexual advances 
uh, towards her, and, and it was the exact opposite that was true, which is so often the case when somebody falsely accuses you of something. It's so often that they're the ones doing the very thing that they're accusing you of doing. When I worked as a paralegal, uh, one of the first cases that we worked on was of a guy that was falsely accused by one of the cities that was near the law office of possessing something that he didn't possess. And I knew the guy from my other job. I've worked at a gun club and then with a lawyer and then the Bible. Those have been my jobs. And uh, so I knew the guy from the gun club, but he had been falsely accused of some things. And I was, when I was working in the law office, I had, we were putting the case together on why the city was wrong in the accusations that they made against him. But because of the accusations and because it was published in, in the newspapers, this man lost his job and he lost his ability to influence people in some of the ways that he was with coaching people at the gun club, all these different sorts of things that happened to him. And so we were working on defending this guy. Now, I don't think that you've probably had something like that happen in your life. But have you ever had a time before where somebody held an assumption against you? Don't you just hate it when that happens? When somebody assumes something about you, they don't even have the facts, but they make an assumption about you, and they hold the assumption against you. You ever had times like that? Where people have accused you of things that are just not true, and you have the option. You can't control those people, but you can control your reaction to it. And you can choose to take vengeance into your own hands. You can choose to become ugly. You can choose to become ungodly. But I think that what Joseph was thinking about in times like this was, God promised me something, and somehow, some way, it's going to happen. He dealt with false accusations by his hope. Or what about the, just the consistent setbacks that he had in his life? After the promises were made, shortly thereafter, his brothers sell him into slavery, and then he rises up and he's in Potiphar's house, and then a lie is made about him, and then he's thrown in prison, and then in prison he interprets people's dreams, and those people forget about him for two years. It's just constant setback after setback. I remember when Samantha and I were in California, and we had had Asher a few months after we moved there. And then Samantha, uh, I think Asher was maybe 14 months old or something like that. And Samantha got pregnant. And that's when the miscarriage happened. And the miscarriage happened on a Sunday morning. And I, was already, I already had my sermon ready to go. And it was when Elijah raises the, widow, uh, the, the widow's son from the, from the dead. dead. And on that Sunday morning, Samantha was in the living room at 4 a.m. giving birth to our dead child in the living room. And at that point in our life, we were wondering, because we want to be able to have at least four kids, is this going to be a setback in the things that, that we're hoping for our family? I don't know what kind of setbacks you've had to deal with. But you, you, you expected life to be one way or, or something like this. And then... Things keep making it seem like it's not going to happen in the way that you want it to happen. Maybe you've had setbacks in your spiritual growth. You don't have the knowledge that you wish you had right now. You don't have the maturity that you wish that you had right now. Do you know what hope does when it's placed in the right place? Is it works through the setbacks. It works through the false accusations. It works through those things to the point where eventually you realize that God was not lying. And there's a lot more that we could say about Joseph, but I want to look at the example of Moses. Look at the promise that was made to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. I don't know about you, this is something that in Exodus chapter 3, this is the famous text where God says to Moses, I am who I am. And then Moses gives these excuses as to why he can't be the one to deliver the people out of Egypt. And there's all kinds of really, really rich, famous lessons from that. And because of all the attention that these other things get in those stories, there was something that I had missed for a long time in Exodus 3, verses 11 and 12. Look at what God promises Moses here. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this, sh sign, this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. 
You've probably seen this before. It took me a long time to see this. That Moses is being told here that one of the signs that you know that you're going to deliver the Israelites is, is not just the Red Sea crossing. That's a big sign. And not just the ten plagues. Those are all big signs. But Moses, it's when you're actually going to get to the same mountain that you saw the Lord in in this burning bush. The same place. Almost as if the Israelites are going to have a similar experience at the same mountain that Moses first had. Moses saw the fiery uh, bush. And the whole nation of Israel is going to get to that same mountain. And there's going to be fire and smoke around the same whole mountain. And Moses is going to know from that, okay, God really sent me to deliver these people. Now the question then is, how long did it take from the promise in, Gen in Exodus 3 to the fulfillment of it in Exodus 19? And you, if you do, it involves some degree of speculation. It had to be under a year, though. And I'm not going to get into all the details on why that would be the case. If you want to ask me about that, I can give you all the details on that. But it had to be under a year that all of this happened. But these, whatever it might have been, seven to eight months, would have been grueling for Moses. What was it that Moses endured from the time of the promise to the time of getting back to this mountain? One thing that we could say was pushing through past failure. In Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is, if you want one chapter in the Bible that gives you a summary of the whole Bible story, it's Acts chapter 7. And Stephen gives this speech where he's talking about the history of the nation of Israel. And he gives interesting details about people like Moses. And he says this in Acts 7.25. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. Now, what is he saying here? Stephen is saying that, do you remember the time when Moses killed one of the Egyptians to try to deliver the people? He was trying to get the ball rolling. And the people of Israel rejected Moses' help. He supposed that they would understand. They didn't. He flees to Midian for 40 years. And so when God says, says to Moses, all right, Moses, you've been in Midian for 40 years. You've been hanging out with all these sheep. That's going to prepare you well for these people that you're going to have to deal with. Go back and deliver these people. Do you know if I'm Moses, what I would say to that? Well, God, I tried that 40 years ago, and it didn't work. But that's, that's not really what Moses says there. He has his hang-ups and things that he needs to work through. But do you know, if you, one of the evidences that you really have hope is that you're willing to try something again that you failed in before. If it's the right thing to do. Maybe you have a sin that keeps causing you to trip up. And you plan your schedule around that sin. You can't stop thinking about that sin. You depend on that sin to make you feel fulfilled, to numb you from the pain in your life. And you keep going back to it. And, and if you wanted to have some kind of New Year's resolution, you say, you know what? Maybe I'm going to try to change this. You go, but I've tried before and it's not going to happen. And you just don't see that kind of excuse with Moses. His hope lifted him past to do the thing that he failed to do the first time. No, no. What else did Moses endure? A bad start. It's not enough. It, it, if it wasn't enough for Moses to go, okay, you know what? I tried this before. Maybe I was using my own wisdom. Maybe I wasn't totally directed by the Lord the first time. But now the Lord's got my back and we're going to do this. You go, okay, well, you know, let's get this started now. Well, do you remember in Exodus 5 when the Israelites uh, are told to make the bricks, but they have to provide their own straw now. And Pharaoh is like Satan where he makes things worse and worse and worse for the people. You know what hope does when you try to start doing the right things in your life and it doesn't work out exactly the way that you wanted to immediately? That life change that you wanted to make, those new habits that you wanted to develop, and you don't have the consistency that you wanted to have immediately, and the, the, the start is kind of shaky. Do you know what hope does? It pushes through it. It says, if I'm going to be with the Lord forever, and my hope is in this place behind the curtain, like Hebrews chapter 6 said, then I'm going to push through whatever I need to push through to be with the Lord forever one day. Maybe you're a newer Christian. And you, you felt like since being baptized that your start has not been exactly what you wanted it to be.
Maybe you've tried starting to read the Bible in a year and you already are behind. Hope helps you push through. But there's another thing that Moses had to endure. And that's complaints from the very people that he was trying to help. Like, before the Israelites even are through the Red Sea, they say this to Moses. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? All right, here's their argument. Moses, you know, the land of Egypt was filled with cities and and construction and all this. You know, there's just probably not enough places to bury us. There's a lot of places in the wilderness. Is that what you're doing with us, Moses? Lots of great places for us to die out here. Can you imagine trying to help all of these people and the only thing they do throughout the whole wilderness time is complain, complain, complain to the very man that God is using to help them? You know what some people might do? I mean, some people would get so bitter that they tried to hold a door open to somebody and they didn't get a thank you. I'm never going to do that again. Here's Moses giving everything he's got for these people. And they keep complaining. And rather than saying, you know what? You all stink. I want you to all die in the wilderness. I mean, they do in a way, but it's not because, you know, but then the new generation comes. But you, you don't see him acting in that way because of his hope. My hope is not in the praise of men. My hope is not just being appreciated by everybody. My hope is ultimately in the Lord, and that will give me the strength to endure any mistreatments I might get. Does your hope do those things for you? Last vignette is the one with David. Look at 1 Samuel 16. And I realize that with each of these examples, there are so many more things to say than we could. But look at 1 Samuel 16, and this is when uh, David is being anointed to be the king. Start in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 16. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but, be, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This, in this moment, David, can you imagine being David here? I mean, you're out taking care of your sheep. And uh, somebody, one of, the, one of the servants of the house or the brothers shouts out to David out there. Hey, David, like, get, get over here. Uh, and, and David runs up to the house and he enters and all the brothers are lined up and there's this strange man with this anointing oil and he goes, okay, all right, this is the guy and he puts oil on his head and suddenly you're the king and maybe, well, how old are you, 14 or 15? I don't know. Strange moment for this guy. But what he's being promised here is that you are going to have the throne, David. You're going to have the kingdom. Okay, immediately? Uh, no, no. Uh, uh, because there, you have to deal with this really jealous king named Saul who feels really insecure about your rise while he has his demise. Well, how long is it going to take then? Well, there's a couple time markers uh, until the point where David finally takes the throne. It's at least a year and four months when he lived uh, amongst the Philistines. Uh, and then also in 2 Samuel 2.11, it was seven and a half years at that point. And, and, and it's not until 2 Samuel 5 when David reigns over the whole nation of Israel. You're looking at at least nine years, maybe. Those are only the time markers that we have. There's other things that we don't get all the time markers, but we get some of those at least. Can you imagine, let's just say for imagination's sake, wait, waiting 11 years. Where you were told you're going to have this position. You're going to have this responsibility. And then you have to deal with all kinds of things. One of them being the jealousy of Saul. The very man who should be helping prop you up is trying to tear you down. What did David endure? 
losing his best friend. You ever, remember when, when David and Jonathan, and they do the whole thing with shooting the arrow, and if the arrow goes past you, then you know that you got to run and all this sort of thing. Um, these, their souls were knit together. And because our culture is so sexualized, everybody has to read all kinds of things into that text that is not there at all. You know how important it is that men have good relationships, real friendships with other men. And women have the same thing. You know, one of the hardest things for Samantha and I, when we moved to Nashville and I was training there, and the last day that we were there on a Wednesday night, do you know how hard that was? And then my last sermon at the church in California, the whole time I was crying. It was like the worst sermon ever. And the whole thing, I was, I was just bawling my eyes out because I had to say bye to people that meant so much to me. How hard is it to say goodbye to people that mean so much to you? What about when people that meant a lot to you let you down? They turn their back on you. They betray you in some way. It's not that you're moving away from the person, but they've moved away from you relationally because of some kind of instant, some kind of thing that happened. You know what hope, I think, did for David? Hope helped him endure all of it and not give up. You know what else David had to endure? Lots of things, but I'm just going to say two things about David. Our opportunities to forego revenge. This is one of the best tests, by the way, to know if you really have hope. You know those times where you know that you could dig into somebody? Where you know that you could make somebody feel the hurt that they made you feel. You know those times? You know what people of hope actually do in moments like that? Is that if they're going to confront something, it's not going to be because I want to get this off my chest and make you hurt. It's because they're trying to be constructive. <coughs> Remember the times when David, who's enduring all kinds of mistreatment from King Saul... He had two opportunities to kill him. And in 1 Samuel 24, verse 6, the Bible says, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. This is when David is in a cave, and Saul is going to the cave to relieve himself, and David's men are hiding in the same cave, and they say, Do it, David! Do it, David! And David responds back to these people, I can't do this to them. I can't do this to the Lord's anointed. Oh, but what a great opportunity it would have been to just let him have it. You ever had moments like that where you want to post things on social media and not even have a personal dialogue with somebody, but just throw it out there for everybody to kind of guess what you're talking about? How tacky. How unlike the Bible that is. Those times where you're in your family or those times that you're around those people that have hurt you and you just want to dig into them. It was just a joke, you know, that sort of thing. What about 1 Samuel 26, verses 9 and 10, when David has another opportunity? But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. It was the third option there, the last option that he brings up there. But David is saying, This is not my job to exercise vengeance. He knows that the Lord is going to take care of it. It's not my job. You want to know why Judgment Day is good news? We live in a society of people that think that God's just judgment and His wrath is such a bad thing. Do you want to know why it's such good news for you? It's because it means that every wrong you've ever faced... Anytime anybody's ever slighted you, anytime anybody's ever slandered you, anytime anybody's ever been ugly towards you, it's not your job to take care of that. I'm not saying there's not times to have conversations about things when it's possible, things like that. But it's not your job to inflict wrath. That's God's job. And if it's true that God is going to do that one day, and it's not my job to get my guns and to get my weapons and all this sort of thing then I can just go ahead and love my enemies and pray for those who persecute me and trust that God's going to take care of everything one day.
What's your hope doing for you in your life? Hope in the future that the Lord is going to bring you into his presence forever. Hope that the Lord is going to judge righteously one day. Not hope that this nation will become what you want it to become. Not hope that your finances will become what you want it to become. Those are things that you might have opinions about, but that's not the thing that anchors you. It's what the Lord has ultimately prepared for those who love him. All of these examples of people that we're looking at ultimately all look forward to the man who made it all possible. Like Joseph, Jesus was mistreated by his jealous brethren. Jesus stood up against the greater Pharaoh and delivered us through a greater deliverance. Jesus is the son of David who toppled over the greater Goliath. Your hope is in him, the one who rose from the dead. Paul said this in Acts 14 to a young church. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Do you see the steadfastness of hope there? What's Paul doing when he's strengthening the brethren, strengthening the souls of these people, saying... There's these things that God has promised. It's going to be rocky until we get there, but God will make do. He's never lied. It's one of the things that's impossible for him to do. If you're here this morning and you've been trying to anchor your hope in something other than the Lord, this is an opportunity to get your life right with God. Everything else will let you down. Everything that you tie your heart to will eventually evaporate and, and, and break your heart. But there's one thing that's a sure, steadfast anchor. Are you putting your hope in it? Is it allowing you to have the power to do the things that we've talked about in this lesson? We're about to sing this song, Savior and Friend. It's through Jesus that we can have all of these blessings. What was that? Yeah, right at the beginning of the song. Hope of the dreary. Light of the glad. This is a beautiful song. As we sing these things, ask yourself if this is what's in your heart. If there's anything that we can do for you, please come forward while we stand, while we sing.